All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is six o'clock and it is the Duncanville City Council meeting by video conference. And today is Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. And don't know where the year has gone, but it's been a very fast time and a very busy time for us. So uh, we do have uh, quite a bit on our agenda for tonight. So I do want to get underway as soon as possible, just to get some general housekeeping items uh, that we need to do. Uh, this is supplemental notice of meeting by video conference in accordance with the order of the Office of the Governor issued March 16th, 2020 as extended by the Office of the Governor June 12th, 2020. The City Council for the City of Duncanville will conduct City Council regular meetings by video conference at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays in order to advance the public health goal of limiting face-to-face -face meetings also called social distancing in an effort to slow the spread of coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. This is an open meeting conducted by video conference. There will be no public access to physical location. Uh, for information for our citizens to speak during citizen comments, they must have registered with the city secretary before 4 p.m. on Tuesday, September 1st, uh, by email to the city secretary and title that a public comment in that email. Uh, individuals who want to do that should have registered uh, prior to this time. And I understand that uh, I have one uh, citizen comment uh, that I have received when we get to that on the open agenda in the city council meeting, I will read that. And we also have a public hearing in our uh, open meeting for the city council later. And in order to speak during the public hearing, uh, individuals will have needed to register in advance with the city secretary. And when the public hearing is opened, I will call on those individuals and I will also give some guidance on how that public hearing is going to be conducted. Uh, so we'll get back to that. Individuals that wish to speak during the public hearing uh, need to use the raise your hand, quote unquote, raise your hand feature in Zoom that's found down at the bottom. And uh, if you click on that, uh, the city secretary, if, if I don't see it, we'll, and the, uh, the city secretary will assist me in looking for those individuals that we wish to speak during the, during the public hearing. A recording of the video meeting will be made available to the public in accordance with the Open Meetings Act upon request. So I'm uh, going to call our uh, briefing session, our working session to order at six o'clock. And audience is in a in listen only mode. Uh, and those who have registered to speak uh, may turn on their microphones by the city secretary. And I'm asking uh, when we get to the point when city council members wish to speak, uh, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, and or raise your hand as such, uh, so that I can see it or city. Uh, Secretary Downs may see it as well and assist me in getting everybody recognized. Okay, any role, any votes that we take during our meeting, as we've done in the past with our video or during our virtual city council meetings, will be done by a roll call vote. Our citizen comments will not be heard during our working session, but will be heard during our regular session. So, uh, in the working session, we come to item number one, which is discuss the agenda items and turn that over to interim city manager, Mr. Paul Fredrickson. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, we have four items on the consent agenda for your consideration. Uh, the first item is a consideration of an award for alley reconstruction and drainage improvements on Madrid Drive uh, from San Juan Drive to Cockrell Hill. Uh, this is a competitive bid process. We had about 11 bidders for an amount not to exceed 331,415. Uh, this is a ongoing CIP project where we do alley repairs every other year. Uh, and those funds come from uh, the $5 surcharge uh, that is placed on water customers bill to help pay, uh, at least assist with the uh, CIP projects for alley reconstruction. Second item is a cooperative purchasing item for with the uh, HGAC with Siddons Martin for emergency equipment. This will be the replacement of the fire engine uh, at station uh, 271. This will be re um, basically taking one piece of equipment, which will be then moved to reserve status and will then uh, become primary equipment uh, uh, at the uh, station on uh, 
on Camp Wisdom. That's our station number one. Uh, this is for an amount not to exceed uh, $781,719. The third item, item C, is considered resolution approving the acceptance of the Edward uh, Byrne Memorial Justice Grant Program, or JAG. Uh, this is a grant that's administered by the city of Dallas. They administer it for the uh, participating cities throughout the uh, Dallas County area. Uh, and so this is an award for $8,678. Uh, this will uh, go to the uh, purchase of ballistic um, helmets for uh, our police department. And then finally, uh, item D is consider resolution to uh, with Burgess and Naples to continue their efforts that they have been working on throughout a number of years uh, with their uh, smoke and sanitary sewer testing. Uh, this is a co contract that will allow for them to uh, continue or finish up a project that was started in drainage area EB that's attached to the agenda item and then also then begin testing uh, for infiltration um, for area uh, WC. That includes a video uh, inspection, uh, smoke testing, uh, it also includes uh, uh, water testing, colored water where we go in there and try to find out where we have any kind of infiltration issues, uh, and, and whatnot, so that uh, that will be for an amount not to exceed nine, $99,000. And those are the four items that are on the consent agenda. Yes, Councilmember Cooks? Yes, uh, Mr. Ferguson, would you go back just, just to quite, you talked about the $5 charge, more so for anyone that's listening, uh, many times we don't know what they don't know what that, that five dollars was added to the water bill, yes, and sir. you went through that and explained that. Can you just very briefly tell them yes, about sir. that one more time for those that missed that? Thank you for asking. Yes, yes, sir. That is a five dollar charge for anybody that has alley service. Uh, as you know, garbage trucks uh, do put a heavy burden on our uh, existing alleys, and so those that have rear alley service. Uh, are charged an additional $5 on their utility bill, and that money goes toward those capital improvements for those alleyways where the garbage trucks utilize those alleys. All right, thank, thank you very much. Sir. Hey, uh, Ms. Jamison, yes, I see your hand. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would like to have a little more information on the last item about the uh, professional engineering service for the sanitary sewer evaluation. It started in 1984. Is this ever going to be complete? Or, I mean, it's like every year? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, we know we still have infiltration issues where we have sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, I mean, this actually helps contribute and identify areas where we have those leaks. Um, you know, this is just part of really part of your ongoing maintenance of our sanitary system. So this helps inform us uh, where we need to make those repairs, pipe bursting projects, uh, sometimes just, you know, if you have existing clean outs. And so it, it is an ongoing uh, maintenance uh, project, but it, it um, has been very helpful in identifying those areas. But also, too, what's important is to make sure that, you know, again, we wouldn't identify any major leaks until we start seeing uh, those flows that will go into the TRA system and getting those charges. And so uh, this is money to make sure that we're really saving money on the, on the back end, if anything else. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, it's, it's a part of your ongoing maintenance. But as far as well, you know, I the that... projects, I think to your point is, you know, as we continue on and kind of try to really uh, get ahead and, and um, stay ahead on the sanitary sewer flows, this is an invaluable information that we need to have. Oh, <clears throat> this is well, we were uh, we last year it was sixty thousand, and this year it's ninety nine. And I know we have continued to have those leaks. So I'm just wondering, you know, is it really that effective? And you know, we just keep doing it every year. We still have breakages, leaks, and there. I don't know. It, at it's what good. point do we value? Hey, whether this is uh... well it's really your only way of finding them and even though we may find some and i think we've made tremendous headway we reported that at your cip meetings or in budget meetings where we've shown 
the progress that we've made on our pipe bursting program, for example. Uh, but any system that goes through aging, that you want to continually monitor that system for any kind of issues with I and I uh, or leaks. Uh, you know, again, the 99,000, 20, about 23,000 of this is, the, is to finish up the survey that was in the um, drainage uh, basin EV. So the other 65,000 is, uh, is to then now start the survey in drainage basin WC. And Greg, oh, you may I? Yes, yes. So <clears throat> a few things is we did increase the amount of money to um, uh, to the, the sewer basin studies. Uh, one was so that we could incorporate uh, the video televising of it, which uh, is very helpful. Uh, the other increase was the reason why we increased it was because of the um, increased attention to our SSOs, sanitary sewer overflows, and um, our efforts to um, get a handle on that. And in addition, um, through the smoke tests, um, it also shows us when the infiltration is on the, the uh, resident side of things. So it tells us if they've got problems with the service line. It tells us if their clean out cap, um, the reason why we're seeing smoke out of a yard is because like their clean out cap that's on their sewer line up by their house got hit by the weed whacker and they need to put a new cap on it. And in the meantime, rain's getting in. So it, it, it helps us both with the city's lines as well as help us as the city know when the um, something in the resident's yard needs to be addressed. And so that input goes to the, um, those findings also not only go to the utility superintendent for you know, his planning for like pipe bursting, but it also goes over the billing officials office so that we can address the issues if they come up in the yards. And again, it is a rotating schedule. As you see, we have about a dozen sewer basins and we hit you know, um, about one every year. And so basically we're only in a particular region every decade or so. So you're saying we're gonna have to have it forever? Yes, as, as um, uh, Mr. Fredrickson said, it is a just a recurring part of, of maintenance, um, just like you know cleaning out the sewer lines and um, any of the other things that we do in order to ensure a, a healthy um, and serviceable system. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, if we can, uh, we can move on to item number two uh, during our briefing session. And this is a briefing presentation and uh, quite an important one. And this is a briefing on the budget and tax rate update uh, by Mr. Summerlin, our finance director, Mr. Summerlin. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, just a moment, okay. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> <laughs> so this is a recap of uh, the prior budget uh, tax calculations. Uh, as you know, SB2 introduced some new nomenclature, the no new revenue tax rate is the rate that's applied to the current year taxable valuations that would essentially yield the same property tax revenues as in the previous budget year. So there's an absolute inverse relationship with property values and that no, never, no new revenue tax rate. So as uh, property valuations go up, uh, that, new, uh, that uh, NNR rate is going to go down and um, vice versa, uh, if the property values go down, that rate will go up. And then the voter approval uh, tax rate is the maximum rate that, that you can have without triggering a general election to approve the tax rate. And that's essentially under SB2 three and a half percent above the NNR rate. Uh, tax rates uh, based on DCAD's legally certified estimates that we received in July, uh, the uh, NNR was 0.748609 and the voter approval tax rate was 773007. And so we filed our budget at the end of July based on the current rate of 0.73743447 uh, because we were below uh, both of those rates uh, at that time. 
And next slide, please. So at the uh, August 13th uh, budget workshop, uh, we presented the estimated tax rate calculations uh, based on the estimated certified tax roll, which I just shared with you. And um, then um, uh, these were uh, much lower than the calculations that uh, were based on the DCAD certified estimates, what, where we thought they would come out. So we shared that with council uh, and uh, for transparency's sake. And the council consensus there was for staff to wait and receive the certified tax roll uh, from uh, the appraisal district and then to recalculate the tax rates, uh, targeting going to a proposed rate uh, equal to the uh, voter approval rate. Next slide, please. So changes that we've had since the August 13th workshop, uh, there, were, there were no changes in any of the other funds uh, except for the general fund. And essentially with the, the rate that we proposed, which is actually a half cent below the uh, voter approval rate, uh, that caused the property tax revenues uh, on the revenue side to decline $794,997. And then um, what we took out on the expense side was the funding for the P25 radio system. So that was simply reduced the same equal amount. And that leaves us with a uh, targeted fund balance for the end of fiscal year 21 at 6.7 million or a 75 day fund balance. Next slide, please. So um, we got the uh, certified tax roll on August 20th and uh, we got the rates certified the uh, NNR tax rate using the certified tax roll is 0.698961, and the voter approval rate was 0.721852. And so we revised the budget to reflect a proposed tax rate of 0.716852, which, I, as I mentioned, is a half cent less than the recalculated VA rate. And the reason that it's a half cent lower uh, was because I had to get uh, uh, the notification out for the public hearing, which required uh, some uh, language uh, and some uh, actual calculations based on the proposed rate. And so at that time, I wasn't sure uh, whether or not the actual certified rates coming back, because I was basing that on my calculated rates, whether they were going to be different. And so as it turned out, um, the VA rate was exactly uh, on target, and um, I was just a very small amount off on uh, just less than uh, 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 a factor of one to the sixth digit on the um, NNR rate. And so um, the general fund uh, property tax revenue difference between VA rate and the proposed tax rate, that half cent, is basically 133,225. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of the um, information that uh, was requested, uh, what I did is I went back uh, to 2015 and I took the uh, NNR rate and uh, the voter approval rate which uh, our target's always been to be uh, just under the VA rate or right at the VA rate. And I calculated what the difference between the adopted rate for each of those years um, was and, and what the NNR rate would be. And you can see the um, third from the last column to the right uh, that's highlighted in yellow, you can see what those uh, differences in, in cents and pennies were, and then what that percentage difference is to the um, next column to the right, and then the last column to the right is what the revenue impact, that's how much the each of those budget years uh, the revenues would have had to have been reduced to go to the NNR rate. Next slide, please. 
So one of the things that I wanted to remind uh, council of is that we, we uh, did make a sales tax election. Uh, this was back before uh, I even came to work for the city of uh, Duncanville. And there were very few Dallas, Dallas County cities that made the sales tax election to reduce the property tax. Those being Balt Springs, DeSoto, Duncanville, Hutchinson's, Hutchins, Lancaster, and Siegelville. So uh, this um, election becomes part of the tax calculation. And uh, in essence, the election to, to apply a portion of our sales tax to reduce the property tax, it reduces the voter approval rate by a little less than 10 cents, which is about an 11.8% reduction uh, in the VA rate. And that is about $2.6 million, uh, less than we, we could uh, have if we were at the maximum VA rate. And so the VA rate without the sales tax election, just to show you how much it would be, would be basically just less than 82 cents per, per hundred valuation. Next slide, please. So here I wanted to take the difference in the revenue from the current uh, tax rate to the NNR tax rate. This was something that uh, council uh, woman Jameson requested. Uh, I didn't have that calculation. Uh, it's a little bit different than the calculations I showed before because it's now based on the certified uh, tax roll numbers and the actual certified tax rates. And so the difference between uh, where we initially filed the budget at 0.743447, and uh, if you went to the NNR rate, would be a 1,185,000 1, 1, decrease. So uh, next slide, please. So then I also uh, wanted to show you know what the difference was between the uh, revenue uh, uh, between the proposed tax rate and the NNR tax rate. So at the proposed rate, which is a half cent less than the VA rate and the NNR rate, we would have to lower the budget an additional $476,680 from where it is, uh, where it stands right now. Next slide, please. So um, the direction that we need tonight is to know uh, what the council, where the council wants to set the rate. And uh, there's, uh, we've got the, the legal notices are, have already been prepared by Dallas County and they were used based on the rate that I proposed of uh, 716852. Now, of course, we can get that changed, but we would have to go back and have them redo the notices, which um, would just be a matter of, of um, time for them to do that. But I, I have uh, actually have to uh, get to the paper, the uh, publications regarding the, the proper notification of the tax rate to the public and the, uh, also notice of the public hearing for um, the tax rate, which will occur on the September 15th meeting. I have to have that to the paper uh, by Thursday uh, this week because they're only publishing the paper on Sunday. And so um, we, we, need to, we need to know what the council wants us to do. Um, and so, um, Done. With that, yes, with that, I'll answer questions or turn it back over to council for discussion. Okay, I'd, uh, before getting to that, I'd like to interject three very, very important points. First point is that we as a city, we as a, as a county and nation have never had to cope with the indecisiveness or uncertainty of the certified tax roll before in our history. And that, of course, is due to COVID-19. So the stress and the pressures put upon our finance department, uh, and Richard in particular, and, and Tia, to make these estimates and do forecasts and whatever statistical 
uh, logarithmic calculations that they needed to do to come out to the best guess prior to even having that certified tax roll was a tremendous amount of work. And uh, I think we owe our great amount of thanks to our finance department for doing the very best that they could with what we served. Remember, we served, we received something from DCAD called an estimated certified tax roll with, you know, and I called that, I think in our last city council meeting when it was discussed, I called that an oxymoron, you know, an estimated certified. What do you do with that? Well, we had to wait until we actually got the certified roll itself. And that's where things really began to come together. And as well for Richard and staff, his initial calculations and estimations were very, very close, which is an indicator of the understanding that he has and the staff has in terms of how our city count, or how our property taxes are measured and how they continue to uh, be evaluated over a long period of time. And the third point uh, I think that's important to make is looking, well, maybe I even have four. The other point is, we have never had to deal with SB2 before. And if you go back, I think it was chart six or so that actually showed uh, where the 8% cap was employed from 2015 until 2021, when that cap is now 3.5%. So this new legislation of SB2 posed another very significant problem or challenge for us, I should say, in terms of coming up with what we need as a city to provide the proper services to our entire citizenry. So the fourth issue is in terms, not an issue, the fourth comment that I have is in terms of looking at our tax rate, our current tax rate without using the, what do we have, six digits uh, in, our, in our decimal calculation, just talking about two digits, our current tax rate is right around 74 cents and what's being proposed is 71 cents. So we, in essence, are looking, um, or what Richard is, is now proposing to us as a council, is actually looking at reducing our tax rate by three cents, but it's still above that NNR. Now, if some may say, well, why can't we go to that NNR? Well, it's, it's quite a bit of money, and that was the impact, and it's still a necessary issue for us to consider how much money do we need to consider to, to continue to operate our city at the level that our citizens require for safety and security and for the services that are necessary to provide that to them. So I guess I actually made four points that I wanted to interject. So it's very important for us as a council to consider what, what Richard has put before us. And in terms of and maybe point five, now thinking about it is the roughly $800,000 uh, that we're not gonna be putting toward the P25, but in order to get a balanced budget, we had to pull that $800,000 away from P25 allocation and put that <clears throat> excuse me, put that back into the general fund. Uh, so this is a, it's a big dollar amount. Uh, we know that P25 is, is coming to us, it's on the horizon. And at some point in the future, we're gonna have to contend with that. But it was the wise and proper thing to do in order to pull that $800,000 out of the P25 allocation to give us a balanced budget. Uh, so uh, those are the comments that I wanted to make. Uh, anybody else have any comments that they would like to make or, or ask questions of, of Mr. Summerlin? And again, uh, these as we go forward, uh, this we will have a public hearing uh, later in City Council. Uh, so we won't be making any, any decisions tonight. Uh, but again, Mr. Summerlin may be looking for some, some type of consensus as moving forward and how we feel about that 71% tax rate. I think I saw Mr. Cooks. Did I, did I see your hand go up, Mr. Cooks? You, you did, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Richard, thank you and, and Paul and all the staff for uh, your hard work in getting us these numbers. And as, as the mayor just mentioned, uh, all of the, the moving parts that went along with this, so thank you. Uh, I too agree with the 71% uh, uh, sales tax, I mean, 71% uh, that we need, 71 cents that we need to go through this. I definitely agree with that. Uh, I did, I, on our last meeting, uh, in reference to this, I asked uh, for Paul to present us with, uh, with the two additional officers scenario as well. And I think all of us received that. Uh, I don't think that will change that our budget too much, uh, which having uh, those two additional officers build into this overall budget. And, and I say that saying that we know 
uh, if we add that to the budget with two additional officers on the street, I mean, let me just emphasize on the street, uh, would eventually would happen until later throughout the year. And so it's not like it's gonna, it will impact us right away. And we get a chance to look at it again mid year. But I, I wanna ask Richard, Richard, how would that, where would that affect uh, this budget? Uh, staying, again, still staying within that 71 cents, how would that affect the budget of, of adding the uh, two officers uh, salary to the, uh, to the budget? Well, <clears throat> well Mark, um, my recommendation would be that when we do our mid-year uh, review of the budget, that we look at how our sales tax is performing because that's the, that's the thing that is the most unclear, unknown thing. Right now, we're trending in a very positive direction above where uh, we budgeted for. And so I would say that there's the potential that we might have enough revenue from additional sales tax collection at that point in time if the impact for, from COVID is not as much as we, we had once thought, uh, that we could fit that into the operational budget. And so okay. we'll know more after we get several months of sales tax collection. So, so you're, I think I'm understanding you're saying not to put it in there now, but wait and see where we are mid year. And, and I guess yeah. I would probably say uh, the, the a little bit have yes and no. I do like for, to look at it in mid year, but I like to still see if we could have it set aside uh, already there because we're not going to, it's not like we're going to have to use it as, as well right then, but have a set aside in that uh, particular bu budget or cost center uh, to allocate for it, because I don't want mid-year this to slip by us uh, and, uh, and, and not be able to look at it again during this time. So that's my recommendation to this council that we look at adding two additional officers in, in the budget. Uh, for this and probably will still not would be funded until after uh, we look at it mid-year as well, as Richard just mentioned, so a combination of both. In, or in order to maintain a balanced budget um, to, you know, to go forward with the, the public hearing and have a, a, a balanced budget, I would, I would then have to reduce something further uh, because we're, we're, we're right at, we're, we're actually just a, a tad bit over on expenditures from an operational standpoint, just by a few thousand dollars. But um, essentially you would, it's considered to be a balanced budget because operating revenues are right, right at um, operating expenditures. So in order to keep that balance, I'd have to reduce something. Would you, then, would you then be able to reduce pulling back from uh, the AMI fund like we did before and just putting it there and not that we use it again, not that it will be used right away. Uh, as you mentioned in mid-year, we'll be able to look at it again. Which, so would you not be able to pull it from there uh, until we know more about it? <clears throat> well, the, 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 fund, the fund balance that we have available um, is basically an un unencumbered fund balance. And it doesn't exactly work that same way uh, because if I start reserving uh, an amount for that, then I'm gonna drop us below the 75 day fund balance that's available. So, and we so let me, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Real quick, let me just, if I may, I just wanna add one more thing too, I think on, on Richard's point is that Two, when we look at this mid-year, we'll also see how we're doing on staffing. And so, you know, um, as we talked about it at the last uh, budget work session, if we, we still have, you know, uh, available positions out there, adding two more uh, would we'll just be adding to that um, need to hire more officers. So that also enables us to look at where we are mid-year as far as how we're doing on our uh, positions that we need to hire for the police department as well. So it gives us that opportunity to see if, if we're close and that we're 100% staffed, then I think that also contributes to the discussion. If we're not, we're still, you know, have a gap. Uh, you know, again, currently I think we're we're down four officers, but are making good, you know, strides. 
toward bringing new officers in. But of course, during the year, we, we you always have a uh, 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 changeover. So just one one more thing, just for for council to consider. Okay. So I do like the I do I do like those agree with those comments that you guys just mentioned. Uh, however, now you have that side of it. Now give me a proposal. If 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 if, if we said go back and let's make it work what would be the alternative so we got the one that you just mentioned wait look at mid-years who we are in staffing uh take a good look at it then where, where sales tax come in now give me the one other scenario if we if we did it now what would you propose to make it work so now i have two options to choose from well i think it's going to be for, for council to discuss i mean council can pull more money out of the P25 system or, or whatever other adjustments need to be made. I mean, I think, you know, we'd look at our budget and say, here's what we have. And again, I go back to the staffing. I think that's, to me, that's, I, you know, to, to say there's a second option, I think we're recommending the one option of looking at mid-year to see where we are. I think that's more prudent because we can be a little bit more conservative as we're looking at our revenues. Our revenues okay. mid-year may not be very, very good. And so I think okay. it gives us the opportunity to present that um, mid-year. Okay, thank you. I was just asking for P20, but my other option was P25. So thank you guys for, uh, again, your hard work. And I, that, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Cooks. I just want to interject something uh, in terms of from a, a lay accounting perspective. One of the things I think Richard was trying to convey to us is that it's under account, accounting rules as I've been taught them and use them and understand them, and I know that they're different for, for municipalities and where I'm coming from, uh, but simply putting a line item in and putting some parentheses around it for some future consideration still has an effect on the overall numbers. And that is where the jeopardy comes in in terms of our being able to say, can we go ahead and put two officers on the budget and as Richard pretty well explained, if you do that, you still have to account for it somewhere else. You've got credits and you've got debits. It's, it's kind of looking at it that way. So even if we were to put some, some budgetary amount in for two additional officers, it can't be anecdotal. It, it has to be accounted for in the accounting process and it's going to affect the general fund numbers. So I think, uh, Mr. Cooks, what, what's fair for us to say is that a note, I'm sure it has been made, I've made a note for myself as well, uh, that mid fiscal year that we'll bring this up and take another look at it and see how we stand fiscally and see if there's an opportunity to actually take some monies from somewhere. And, and the possibility, as you mentioned, could be AMI, could be P25. But there again, P25 is that lever that's hanging over us. It's going to be there. And it's a big number in AMI as well. We know that we need that for our city. Uh, the other thing I think we need to take into consideration is we'll need some input from Chief Brown. Uh, to tell us our two additional officers necessary. Uh, while we look at, at, at the, the police force that we have, I'm not familiar with, I'm not up to speed on the number of vacancies that we have right now. I know the last number we had was three, uh, which is pretty good. So I know at times we've been 10 under on our, on our force. Uh, but, you know, there again, it, it come mid-year, uh, it'd be wise for us to ask Chief Brown and Chief Levigny for some input on how they feel about our force and what we need to do with it. So um, I agree with what Richard is saying. It, I, it'd be good to throw some numbers in there. I see you, Ms. Jamis. I see you, Ms. Jamison. It would be, it would be good to throw some numbers in there. And accounting wise, it's not the, the right thing to do in terms of how it's gonna affect the overall budget. Uh, we have to go by some accounting standards to make that thing actionable for us. Uh, so Ms. Jamison, yes, please. Thank you, because there are other ideas too. Mine was the point six nine, and I understood that you were going to come back with some things that you could take out of the budget to meet that also. Uh, people have lost their jobs, they've lost their homes. Uh, this is the largest unemployment we've ever had with this COVID-19, and to uh, I don't think it's too much to ask the city to make some reductions. And a uh, majority of people have had to do that. And um, in the past, on the council, we have asked the city manager to ask the departments to go back and find areas each one can cut back to add to the reductions. 
so that uh, we can, I mean, that, that's the NNR rate. And uh, I, I would like to see what you could cut back to reach that 0.69, because the one thing that's not being said that people are not considering, our council's not considering or not saying anything is that home appraisals have gone up. And so uh, the amount that people are paying is more. And I think it's not too much to ask us to tighten our belt and to look at ways that we can cut back. It's not necessary that we spend every penny. And particularly when we're in a, a time of need like this, I don't think it's too much to ask to get us to uh, find areas that we can cut back. And that's every department across the board. It's not just one department that has to take the hit. Um, you know, we talked about this before, administrative personnel. Uh, I mean, there's each department can come up with something to cut back and help us come up with a rate that is, I have heard from the people in my district, maybe you haven't, but they are begging us not to go up any, that they feel like they're in dire straits right now. And, you know, to continue to talk about spending more, I'm just, I'm just we need to be talking about tightening our belt, finding ways to, to uh, be conservative and to not expect, um, we're not we're not sitting in a time of uh, uh, prosperity. We're not, and so rather than continuing, I mean, we can find lots of ways to spend. We need to be considering ways to cut back, and I would appreciate it, Mr. Summerlin, if you would, with the point six nine, find. Uh, some ways that the other departments could cut back and we could meet that with the least amount of um, pain, I guess, if you will. Okay, point taken. Any other comments? Recognizing as well, and I'll reiterate that we are dropping our tax rate by three cents, uh, but going to that 0.69 again, uh, whether it's feasible to continue to operate the city with the, with the 0.69 tax rate, oh, even though property values have gone up, that's going to be in a matter for, for continued evaluation. That's uh, so the any third other time you talked. The third time you presented your point. Thank you. All right, uh, if that concludes everything, I believe we are done. Uh, Mr. Summerlin, uh, you're finished with that. And that concludes our briefings and presentations in our work session. Uh, we're good on time. So I believe what we can do is we can go into executive session at this time. Um, now, wonder, uh, just want to uh, read the caption for our executive session. Uh, the council shall convene it to close executive session pursuant to sections 551.072 and 551.087 tax, uh, Texas Government Code to deliberate and discuss an offer for economic incentive agreement and the sale and or exchange of real property located at um, 730 East I-20, Duncanville, Texas. Uh, we will leave our video conference to go into executive session by go meetings. The City Council will return via Zoom once the executive session is completed. Uh, council members, please make sure you leave the current regular meeting and click out. I uh, want to uh, also uh, understand uh, that there has been some communication uh, with one of our council members in terms of participation in this executive session as it applies uh, to Mr. Anderson. So uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, you do have that legal advice and um, I'm requesting that you abide by that and that you would recuse yourself from participation in this executive session. Is that acceptable? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. City Secretary, yes, ma'am. Also, uh, Mr. Summerlin has been waving his hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, Mr. Summerlin. I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make certain before we move on from the budget that 
there is a consensus that the proposed rate will be uh, the 7.716852. Um, I know that we have one dissenting comment, um, and if there's no other dissenting comment, I believe our city council consensus would be that the point seventy one would be uh, moving forward with that as consensus. If there's any disagreement with that, uh, please let me see a hand or let me know. Otherwise, we have consensus. I see you, Ms. Jameson. We, we understand your dissent, and you would prefer to... No, you don't understand what I'm going to say. No, sir, you don't understand what I'm going to say. Please. What I was going to say is... I asked at the last meeting that I could see with 0.69 what that would do. I see the money amount, and my request has been to see what we could do to cut back to meet that. We see what one item could be taken out to meet the 0.71. I would like to see what we could take out to meet the 0.69. And I asked that at the last meeting. Do you have any suggestions in terms of what department you would like to see those cuts come out of? Because I don't have across the board. You said the pain itself. We were talking about laying off our own people and incurring more pain. Mayor, I have been uh, many cities laid off a lot of people. We didn't lay off anybody, um, and I've been on the council for a while. And we have in the past asked department wide everybody to go back and find some areas that they could cut back. That's normal. And if you're very familiar with accounting, then you know that's normal. And you know it's normal in a company to go back and cut, cut out some things that are not terribly necessary. I know at AT&T, we cut out housekeeping. So, I mean, there are things that can be cut back. They can do it. And I asked to see what it would do if you, if you went back and asked those departments to cut back. To, to uh, you know, I'm not asking for any one department. I didn't. We didn't ask to see the amount that they cut back where it came from. They picked it. They chose it, and that's okay. All I ask is to see what if you if you cut it back to 0.69, what you could take out to meet that. The better way to evaluate it is if we take if we drop back to 0 0.69, what do our citizens do without? Oh, please. You, you really, this is theatrical. Well, you, we didn't have saying, this kind no, of money to spend for years. We didn't no have this kind of revenue. We're trying to keep this as a professional discussion. And that's what well, we it's not, to. because you're doing all the talking. You don't allow other council people to talk. You can come, come in twice. If somebody wishes speak. to speak, I'm more than ready to allow them to speak. Yeah, right. There are no hands going up, and that's when I asked the question about consensus, and there was no indication from any other. But you, you are know. restating, you are restating what I said. I didn't. You said what I said was what the citizens could do without. I didn't say that. I did not say that. I asked the city staff to see what areas that they could cut back to efficiency. You know to make it uh, a lean, mean machine. And we've never had this much revenue before. So you tell me all these years we were flopping? No, we have increased our spending as more revenue came in. And without a doubt, there are areas that we could cut back, without a doubt. And I am talking about caring about our citizenry, the ones who've lost their jobs, the ones who've lost their homes, they can't pay rent. We have more people probably than ever before struggling to pay water bills and electricity. So we can cut back, we can, we can do it. And it's not asking citizens to do without city services. It's asking the city to find areas that they could be more efficient and come back to us with some areas that they could cut back. But I, I, I don't want to be, uh, for you to decide what I'm saying, that I'm talking about uh, what the citizens could do without. That's theatrical. I'm asking staff to come back with something that they can cut back and still be efficient and meet that 0.69. 
And I know Kent Cagle had told you to do it. I was here. City Council, uh, I go back to Mr. Summerlin's request uh, in terms of consensus from our council of the 0.71 versus uh, Ms. Jamison's dissent for 0.69 to have it re-examined to see what could be reduced in terms of our budget. Um, if there is no further discussion uh, by any council member, if I don't see any indication from any other council member, we have consensus among the council, not unanimity, make that clear, we do not have unanimity, but we have council consensus uh, to move forward to the 0.71. Seeing no indications from any other council members, Mr. Summerlin, you have consensus. You also have Ms. Uh, Jamison's input, which has merit. I'm not discounting that, it does have merit. Uh, and, and I don't think any of us council members are in a position to, to go through the line items and, and begin to strike people. Uh, but you know, if there's any consideration that can be given to that uh, by Mr. Fredrickson or Mr. Summerlin or any director, I'm certain that they will uh, exercise due diligence to, to try and do that. Okay, uh, Mr. Summerlin, do you have your consensus? I do, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, City Council, uh, we will then go into executive session. If you would please depart, uh, leave this meeting, and we are going to um, leave here. I'm going to take a timestamp at 6.51, and we will go into executive session. Waiting. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Ramey informed me that there was a minor uh, transcription error in the resolution on the consent agenda for D, that the actual resolution in your packet has the wrong basins in it. We will make that correction. If you would note that the resolution needs to conform with the council agenda item. What was the change again, Bob? Uh, the actual resolution has the wrong basin reference. The resolution that's in on the agenda is correct. So the actual resolution in your packet had the wrong basin in the reference. But Basin EB is correct in what we have on the agenda. Uh, yes. Okay, got it. And so I will make that change. So when you sign it, uh, I'll get with Kristen and get that change made. So when you sign it, it'll have the correct uh, okay. references in it. Thank you. Just to the FYI, Mr. Hager, I made the change and I sent it to you for your approval. Okay. Well, That'll be ready that, for the then mayor. we'll be good. If mayor, if you just want to stick with the. Uh, um, uh, as, read. as posted, we're fine. Okay. All right. All right. I see um, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Cooks, Mr. Veracruz, Mr. McBurnett. I don't see Ms. Jameson yet. I see her name on there. I just oh, do you? I missed. Yeah, there's a lot of people in the panelists. I was just trying to scroll down. Been here, Sarah Cruz. There she is. I heard you talking about the basin. <laughs> I got her. I got her. I see her. Okay. All right. We are all back. Um, so let me get to where I need to be. All right, so uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are back uh, from executive session. Thank you for your patience. And we're now going to convene into regular session of our city council, chain, city council. And I'm calling our meeting to order at 749. And uh, if it's okay, I would like to call on uh, Mr. Mac Burnett uh, to give our invocation, if you would, please. Thank you, Mayor. Great and glorious God, we thank you. We 
are so glad that we have you in our lives. Hope you can help with us, guide us, lead us so we can follow you. And we ask that in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you would uh, please rise and uh, say your pledges to our flags, please. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we are back and uh, moving on to item number one is the uh, mayor's report. And in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, dispense with that. So no mayor's report tonight. So any council members reports? Uh, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll make my brief as, as well. Uh, as, as a constant reminder, we have census time, please complete your sentence. Uh, another quick note, and Duncanville Lions, I have to con put a congratulations out there for them for being a top fundraiser for the camp, uh, the, the, for special needs that we have, and Duncanville being highlighted as the, as the number one club on contributing. And lastly, I wanna recognize the mayor, because Saturday on August 29th, he and Marla celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you for that, uh, Don. Um, and all I ask of everybody is don't do the math, okay? <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I, have a, I am blessed with, uh, with uh, just the uh, words can't describe how blessed I am with, with Marla's and for the 50 years that we've had and for uh, the opportunity to, to live and travel and, and work around the world and to, to give us that exposure to, to, to country. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, any other city uh, council members reports? Mr. Cooks. Yeah, I, I echo that. Congratulations, Mayor. I had to recount those numbers as well after being challenged that I really read 50 or not. So congratulations. Hey, no, I wanted to thank uh, our senior uh, director, one of our senior directors, Noah Garcia, for uh, being a participant on the Meet, Connect, and Learn last Saturday with seniors and with caregivers uh, and with those who are supporting, needing support. Uh, Noel did a, fan, a great job in presenting to probably over 400 people uh, when, it, when, it, when we finished, about 400 people, talking about all the services we offered seniors. So that was a big hit. We hope to, at some point, be able to add to that again. Uh, Mayor, thank you again for uh, for attending and your comments, and uh, we really appreciate that, and I know our citizens did. So uh, next coming up is going to be a budget a little bit with the mayor and myself. So our next Meet, Connect, and Learn will be uh, talking about some high level where we're looking at from a budget standpoint. So, so everybody, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other council member reports? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to item number two, uh, proclamations and presentations. And this is a proclamation recognizing September 2020 as Valiant Women of the Vote Month. And to present this proclamation, Council Member Jamison, if you would please. Thank you. On the proclamation, Whereas on June 4th, 1919, Congress passed the 19th Amendment guaranteeing all American women the right to vote. And whereas the year 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, guaranteeing and protecting women's right to vote. And whereas the centennial offers an opportunity to commemorate a milestone of democracy that the right of citizens of the United States to vote 
shall not be denied or abridged by the federal or state governments on account of gender. And whereas throughout our history, women have influenced every facet of American life and culture. And whereas women have been pioneers in the fields of science, medicine, engineering, education, finance, arts, journalism, business, government, and more. And whereas the 2020 theme, Valiant Women of the Vote, pays homage to the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, the theme honors the brave women who fought to win suffrage rights for women. Now, therefore, I, Barry L. Gordon, mayor of the city of Duncanville, Texas, do hereby proclaim September as Valiant Women of the Vote and urge all citizens to acknowledge the importance of this date and to observe this month and celebrate women with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Thank you, Ms. Jamison. And I want to thank you and congratulate you for your uh, participation and involvement in our city uh, over the long term and for your contributions for all that you've done to make our city the very, very best. And also for congratulations for your appointment to the National League of Cities. I, I don't recall the exact committee, but I know it's, it's an important committee and it has to do with uh, women in government. What was that? Name of that committee? Women in municipal government. Thank you very much. So congratulations on that. It, it's, a, it's a great hallmark in your career to be able to participate on a national level uh, with the National League of Cities for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number three, <clears throat> excuse me, on our agenda, it's citizens input. And pursuant to section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code, any member of the public has the opportunity to address the city council concerning any matter of public business or any posted agenda item. However, the act prohibits the city council from deliberating any issues not on the public agenda and such non-agenda issues may be referred to city staff for research and any future action. All persons addressing are subject to council adopted rules and limitations permitted by law. And we do have a city council, uh, city uh, limitation that uh, citizens comments are limited to two minutes. Uh, so in order to speak uh, during this particular time, the individuals must have registered with the city secretary before 4 p.m. Uh, September 1st, that being today, and or sending an email. Uh, so I do have uh, an email from one citizen that I would like to read into the record. And this is uh, from, uh, well, I'll just read it because uh, it, it, uh, it, it will be self-explanatory. Uh, it says, I am Julian Leshna, owner of Roma's Italian Bistro here at Main Station in Duncanville. We are aware of the executive decision at tonight's meeting about w &B Company. We want you to reconsider and keep their headquarters here in Duncanville. Their employees and staff have been our customers at the restaurant for nine years now. They will be dearly missed if they're no longer part of our community. Please reconsider and keep them in our city. Thank you for your time and God bless. Uh, so city secretary, do we have any other citizens input? We do not, sir, that is it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we are moving on to item number four on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. Uh, so the following may be acted upon in one motion, and city any city council member may uh, request items to be moved if so desired. But uh, city secretary, uh, would you please read the consent items? 4A, consider a resolution authorizing award of IFB number 20-015 alley reconstruction and drainage improvements between Madrid Drive and Granada Drive from San Juan Drive to South Cockrell Hill Road to CCGMG LLC Series B through the city's competitive bid process with an estimated expenditure amount of $331,415. 4B, consider a resolution authorizing a cooperative purchasing agreement with Citizens Martin Emergency Group through the Houston Galveston Area Council Cooperative Purchasing Agreement Contract FS12 19 for a new fire engine in the expenditure amount of $781,719.75.
4C, consider a resolution approving the application for an acceptance of Edward Bryan Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program funding to be administered by the City of Dallas in the amount of $8,678.48 and approve the purchase of ballistic helmets commensurate with the award amount. 4D, consider a resolution approving the terms and conditions of Professional Engineering Service Agreement PSA number 20-017 for sanitary sewer evaluation surveys of Basin WC and Basin EB with Burgess and Nipal Inc. for a total cost not to exceed $99,000. Thank you very much. The Chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent items. Uh, Mr. Mac Burnett has made a motion to approve. Is there a second? Mr. Vera Cruz has uh, made a second to the motion to approve. Uh, City Secretary, a roll call vote, please. Council Member Vera Cruz, for or against? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Mac Burnett, for or against? Four. Council Member Anderson, for or against? Four. Council Member Cooks, for or against? Four. Council Member Jamison, for or against? Four. Council Member, um, at large Council Member Harvey, for or against? Four. Mayor Gordon, for or against? For. Uh, thank you. The, the motion is approved. Moving on to item number five on our agenda, items for individual consideration. Uh, this is to receive an overview of the proposed fiscal year 21 budget and conduct a public hearing. Uh, we will have the presentation by Mr. Summerlin, our finance director, and subsequent to his presentation, we will then open up um, the public hearing. So, Mr. Summerlin, please. And thank you, Mayor Council. So this will be a, a quick run through, uh, primarily concentrating on uh, the three larger funds, the general fund, utility fund, and solid waste fund. Uh, there, uh, in the packet, there's information on all the other funds, but those will be the three that I'll primarily concentrate on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Wanted to give uh, an overview of all funds combined. There are total budgeted revenues by fund are 61 uh, and a half million. And so you can see right away from the pie chart that the general fund and the utility fund uh, are a little over 80% of the entire budget. So those are the the two largest and then solid weight being the solid waste being the third largest at seven percent of the budget. Next slide please. Um, the total uh, FY21 budgeted revenues by source uh, again 65.5 million and you can see that uh, property tax sales tax uh, make up almost half of the pie chart with the uh, water and wastewater fees being included in there, which goes to the utility fund. And then our garbage fees, which are solid waste being uh, the one of the next largest. Next slide, please. General fund revenue uh, by source. So now we're just talking about the, the lasering out the general fund, uh, 32.6 million. Property taxes make up about 55% of that. Sales tax, 22% uh, transfers uh, in from uh, other funds, uh, other sources, 8.07%. And then our uh, franchise receipts, about five and a quarter percent. Permits and fines, 6%. And then interest and other uh, miscellaneous revenue, about three and a half percent. Next slide, please. General, general fund expenses by type, uh, 34.2 million in total. You can see that uh, being a service uh, organization, we're very heavy on uh, in terms of the, our makeup of employee costs. So salaries and benefits make up uh, almost 63% of uh, the budget. And then services and maintenance about 20, 25%. And then you can see, um, the, the remaining uh, services. 
Next slide, please. So some of the major uh, revenue changes that uh, we uh, are dealing with in this budget, of course, Senate Bill 2 reduced the property tax cap from 8% to 3.5%, and that significantly reduced the city's primary revenue, which is property tax. Uh, Senate Bill 1152 uh, also reduced certain franchise tax payments uh, related to um, telephone and cable companies that uh, use our uh, right-of-way to house their equipment and lines. And essentially, uh, if, they, um, <clears throat> if they pay two different types of franchise tax for telephone and cable, they can pay the lower of, uh, they get to choose the lower of the two. Uh, and then, of course, we experienced COVID-19, uh, something we could not foresee, but we experienced it. it had a major impact to our sales tax revenues, and um, many of our sales tax generating businesses were either closed or uh, they were, had a reduction in their, their activity that generated sales tax. And then, of course, Duncan Bill lost one of the major sales tax generating companies back in January prior to COVID-19. Next slide. So the, the right column, the 2021 budget, you can see that we uh, have this budget structured in such a way that uh, we intend to uh, end the, the fiscal year with uh, our targeted 75 days fund balance. And um, the, the typical cities, go for a 60 day fund balance, but we've elected a 75 day fund balance for the last several years. And it uh, goes to the, um, speak, uh, it speaks to that conservatism and how we're able to uh, uh, have, have as much fund balance um, for this year because we had um, a bigger fund balance coming in ending uh, FY20, we did uh, quite a few reductions. And so we had a bigger fund balance that rolled over to start the year with. And so that was very helpful uh, in having that. And uh, it helped to um, cushion the, the blow of losing the sales tax. So next slide. Looking at the uh, budgeted uh, revenues from FY21 that are proposed in this budget compared to the FY20 adopted budget revenues. You can see that our property taxes uh, with the proposed tax rate uh, equal to the voter approval rate uh, uh, with a half cent reduction from there, uh, that increase is $466,000 uh, over the prior year. Uh, our sales tax uh, uh, took more than that away uh, with the, what we anticipate our sales tax to be for this year from the, the effects of COVID. So that's a 566,000 decrease. As I mentioned uh, earlier with the uh, SB 1152, the franchise receipts are gonna decrease 127,000. Uh, we expect our permits and fees to go up 84, fines down 49, uh, interest on investments um, de decreasing 25,000 because of the lower interest rates. And then um, our rec fees are down 40, or we expect them to be down 45,000. And then other revenue down 140,000 for a total decrease in revenues of about 286,000 overall. Next slide. And I'm not gonna to reiterate um, too much of this, but I, I do wanna talk about the property tax uh, rate. Well, our, uh, the current property tax rate in the city of Duncanville is 74 uh, cents uh, per, per 100 evaluation. And the budget's built on a proposed tax rate of 71 cents, which is about a 3.6% decrease. Overall, the taxable value valuations this year increased about 6.3%. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, I won't go through all of these. This is just a reiteration of what I talked about before. Um, 
the 140,000 decrease in other revenue, uh, I didn't mention the reason behind that. Of course, that's the loss of our lease revenue from the old, um, the old uh, library that we have out in front of City Hall. Um, next slide. So then looking at the expenditures, you can see that the uh, uh, different areas of the city, uh, what the increases and decreases were uh, for uh, each of those areas. And then uh, within the non-operating, the transfers and other area, the same thing. You can see increases and decreases uh, for this budget year. And so uh, primarily, most all of the money that uh, we have uh, coming in from the um, property tax increase is going to fund the P25 uh, radio system, um, which we put $350,000 in there last year, and uh, we're proposing to um, fund $838,000 from this budget, um, and um, that will get us close to. Um, a little over halfway of funding uh, for that P25. Um, next slide. So um, we did uh, go through and, and do quite a few cuts in uh, the FY21 proposed operating budget. Uh, we did 205,000 uh, in cuts for travel and training. Uh, in our insurance and some staffing changes that included some position reorganizations. We reduced our fleet replacement contributions by 17,000 based on a healthy fund balance. And we had uh, $49,000 in savings that we estimate in the budget from the detention cost center reduction uh, going to the regional jail uh, system. Next slide, please. Um, so when we look at um, some of the increases that we had in the FY21 budget, uh, we had a 279,398 retiree medical expense that previously was housed in the medical insurance fund, which was an internal service fund. But since we're no longer self-insured, um, it was prudent for us to move that to the general fund. And so there was no place really to put the retirees um, there's not too many retirees still on our, our medical insurance, so uh, we put that in general government. And uh, $69,300 was an increase in IT replacement fund contributions. That was because uh, based, we do a five-year forecast on our IT replacement needs, and we had been running uh, that funding at only about 30% of um, what the, the, the um, the actual um, calculation for revenues uh, needed to be because our fund balance again was healthy, but because of some increases in costs and, and increases coming up uh, in the future years, we had to increase that funding from 30% to 80%. We had $146,900 increase in our animal shelter and our Southwest Regional Communication, or our 911 center. Uh, that, that stemmed from the uh, 49,000 of that came from the Surgical Operations uh, Center and covering the budget shortfall because the animal shelter experienced quite a bit of reduction in their contributions uh, during the pandemic. And then we had a 97,000 uh, increase in our 911 uh, dispatch center. Uh, they um, had uh, to purchase some new software and they also uh, were changing some of their policies for budgeting where they no longer are using dipping into their fund balance. But um, in other words, they're in increasing their amount that they uh, are budgeting to receive from the other cities enough to uh, maintain ongoing operations. And then we had 188,000 uh, compensation plan that was included in the budget. And that would be a 2% two, 2 at mid-year. And that would be uh, subject to evaluation depending on recovery from uh, the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. 
We also had a $340,400 um, uh, transfer to a medical insurance fund that was a decrease because uh, we, we don't need that in the current budget year because again, as I noted before, um, from an accounting standpoint, we've melded our self-insurance fund into the general fund, so that's not needed. And then we had a decrease at 425,000 to one-time project funds and $80,000 increase in our transfer to our grant fund. And that's due to the, that every two years we fund our CDBG grant fund. And then 265,000 increase in our transfer to street CIP. And that was to cover funding for 50,000 road design for Beaver Creek Swan Ridge, 75,000 road design for East Car, 61,000 for Wintergreen Phase One payment to Dallas County, and 79,000 for the U.S. Green Ribbon Contract Administration. Next slide. So we also increased, as I noted before, 488,000 in our reserve for P25 radio project. Uh, so that goes into the budget and. Again, that's a little over, slightly over half. Uh, that brings our total funding this year, uh, plus uh, reserve funds for this year uh, to a million one, and the total project cost is estimated at two million. So we'll either have to issue bonds to cover that cost, or we'll have to find that money in future budgets. And the future budgets are few uh, very few between now and implementation. $100,000 uh, decrease in economic incentive payments, uh, and that was due to the commitment ending for uh, DeFords in FY20. Next slide. So some of the challenges, um, are of course the economic recovery is uncertain from the pandemic, um, but this budget includes no new programs, no new projects, no new positions. And uh, as I'll demonstrate uh, in a minute, uh, we have very lean staffing levels. We're one of the leanest cities in the metro area, maintaining our services at current levels with current staffing, it continues to be a challenge. Um, we also are competing with uh, uh, pay and benefits from our surrounding cities as they continue uh, to increase uh, their pay and benefits to their employees. And we're also now finding that uh, a lot of people that are leaving the city are going to work for the private sector because um, they have uh, higher, higher, higher salaries and they're able to attract our employees. Uh, we also um, continue to have to comply with more and more uh, regulatory and reporting mandates. And uh, even though, you know, those, those regulatory and reporting mandates increase every year, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't get to increase staffing every year. And so can, keeping up with those mandates is difficult and it's a challenge. And then, uh, of course, we uh, have been trying for the last several years to uh, restore uh, the amount of deferred street maintenance and other uh, building equipment maintenance costs so that uh, we keep our infrastructure in um, a good shape, in, in, a, in a good position. And of course, uh, each of our budgets, there's always a challenge. There's uh, never enough money to cover all the things that need to be fixed and need to be repaired. Uh, next slide. So looking at the citizen serve per employee, this is one benchmark that you uh, can compare to other cities. We fall kind of in the middle there, uh, serving about um, uh, 150 citizens per employee. And so next slide. The average payroll per employee, uh, I think this slide is very telling. You can see that Duncanville uh, in uh, the, the group of cities that uh, were surveyed that uh, we fall uh, one from the bottom in terms of the average payroll for employees. So not only are we running a lean organization with very few employees, but we're also uh, very near the bottom in terms of pay scale. Next slide. 
So one of the things that uh, is also a comparative note is to look at the taxable valuations per capita. And so this is basically the total taxable values divided by the population. And so you can see that Duncanville has a much lower uh, tax burden than our neighboring cities. In other words, um, our, our total taxable valuations are about 27% lower than the average of Lancaster, Cedar Hill, and DeSoto combined. And uh, I threw out Dallas because they're a much bigger city, but I just showed them for comparison here on the chart. Uh, next slide. Another way to look at this is to look at the total tax levy per capita. This is simply the, the, the total tax levy divided by the population. And you can see, again, that Duncanville per citizen per capita is much lower than our surrounding cities. In fact, it's that same 27% lower than the, our average for uh, Cedar Hill, DeSoto, and Lancaster. Next slide, please. And then so this is a chart of how our uh, property values, uh, as we came out of the uh, housing uh, crash from 2008 and 9, you can see that we were still um, experiencing lower valuations all the way up to 2012. And then uh, from that point on, uh, the property tax valuations have continued to increase as we build back um, value in our residential and our commercial. And the green portion is representative of our residential and the, the kind of teal blue uh, portion is our commercial and business personal property. And so you can also see there that uh, we're highly dependent on residential because we just don't simply don't have that much commercial uh, and business personal property in the city of Duncanville. Next slide. I like to remind people that um, when you get your tax bill, it's made up of many components. And the school district, and this is not just in Duncanville, but it's true across most cities, uh, the school district uh, takes uh, uh, about 52% of the total tax that you pay. The city of Duncanville takes a little over a quarter of that or 25% and then uh, the various Dallas County organizations take up the remainder. Next slide. I'd like to uh, chart our sales tax history as we've worked very diligently to increase our economic development and expansion within the city of Duncanville. You can see that we had a fair, fairly steady rise from 2012 uh, up through 2018. And then we began to fall off in 2019 with a, just a little bit of a marginal decrease. And then, of course, uh, in FY20, we experienced the COVID and we had a pretty major decrease. And we're expecting uh, that decrease to go into 2021 and for it to be slightly lower than 20. Um, next slide. So I um, want to remind people that our sales tax election that uh, we made many years ago, it is part of the tax rate calculation. And there's only a very few cities in Dallas County that made that election. Those cities being Balch Springs, DeSoto, Duncanville, Hutchins, Lancaster, and Siegelville. So this reduction uh, plays into the tax rate calculation and it reduces the tax rate that we can legally have uh, through the uh, voter approval rate by uh, just a little bit less than 10 cents, which is about an 11.8% 11, 11 reduction on the tax rate. And that um, amount of revenue is equal to about 2.6 million. So that 2.6 million is basically the property tax relief that, that we elected to um, to have many years ago. And so we, we, I think it's important to remind people that that very much affects the, um, the amount of tax you pay. It's, uh, it's a, a great benefit. So next slide. Going into the utility fund, um, we will, um, next slide please. 
uh, just taking a look at that, uh, as you know, uh, we expect to uh, end the year with an ending fund balance of about 6.9 million. And um, we've had our uh, eye on a reserve for our uh, automated uh, uh, um, meter infrastructure. And um, we've had a five, five million uh, fund reserve. Of course, we haven't spent that, but uh, because we haven't raised rates over the last couple of years, we're starting to eat into that. And so if you take that five million reserve out of the fund balance, that only leaves us 37 days of fund balance. And that's my, well below our, the target that we need to have of 60 days of fund balance. So next slide. So you can see I charted the um, fund balance over history during the FY uh, 12 and 13. We were not, not doing, and for several years before that, we were not doing any type of rate increases. And we drew our fund balance down to a very low uh, margin of about 2.1 million. And then we implemented a series of rate increases um, and so for 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, we continued to raise uh, the rates. Um, most of those years, the last uh, three of those years, we just simply passed through our increased cost for uh, water, uh, purchase of water from uh, the city of Dallas and for our sewer treatment from uh, the Trinity River Authority. So uh, we were just simply uh, passing through what uh, the increase in our costs were. And then of course, we did not raise rates in 19 or 20, and we have not proposed to raise it, uh, any rates for 21. And so we're, um, you can see by that fund balance how fast it's falling uh, for FY20 and FY21 because we have not raised rates. Uh, next slide. So um, the water and sewer revenues, um, they uh, are trending up a little bit above where they were for FY20, and that's just based on uh, historical usage and, um, and the, the, uh, where we are from, from our year to date. Uh, we have um, a 35,000 projected increase in utility billing penalties and late fees uh, for FY21. Uh, we suspended for a good long period of time in FY20 uh, cutoffs, and uh, then we also suspended those utility billing uh, penalties uh, during the uh, COVID when uh, the uh, Public Utility Commission asked us to not cut people off. And so uh, we did that, but we're, we're now um, expecting a little bit of increase in 21 because that ban has been lifted. Uh, we also had a 26,000 previously unbudgeted increase in city services, and that's for increased surcharges. Next slide, please. Next. Oh, thank you. So um, looking at our fund uh, expenditures, you can see um, the areas that increased and decreased and the percentage of variance, and uh, I'll go through some of those major ones. Uh, next slide, please. So our utility accounting overall decrease was about 77,000. We had 22,000 where we decreased salary costs and 82,000 in meter purchases, um, 13,000 decrease in fleet contribution, and then we had a 50,000 increase and the banking fees that, uh, we're, that we incur for credit card transactions. Uh, as you know, we don't, uh, we don't pass those credit card fees through uh, to people who pay by credit. Uh, we absorb that cost. And so um, that, that we're, just, we're having a lot more people use credit cards, especially during COVID because uh, people are paying online and not coming in. Um, then our utility admin overall decrease was about 6,982. Uh, we had a 7,000 decrease in salary savings because we hired a new person and their salary was lower than the outgoing person. 5,000 decrease in over budgeted 
uh, contract services, um, investment advisor fees, and, and then we also reduced some travel costs. Then we had a 5,000 increase in uh, medical group insurance costs. Next slide. And then our water services, we had an overall increase of 129,608. Uh, we had uh, 155,000 that were uh, added for Dallas water costs. We there were pat that we have a 5.1 percent increase in variable costs and a 4.6 percent increase in fixed costs, and that was offset by a $25,000 uh, reduced fleet contribution. And then in wastewater, we had an overall decrease of $80,000. We had a $208,000. $900 increase in our TRA cost, and then a $14,000 uh, uh, increase that we added for uh, contract services uh, to help uh, mitigate the SSO problems, uh, uh, sanitary sewer overflow uh, problems, and then that was offset by a uh, $51,000 uh, decrease in our fleet contribution, a $20,000, $23,000 decrease in direct materials for utility cut repairs, and then another 23,000 decrease in supplies, clothing, travel, and maintenance that we cut. And then our non-operating overall decrease uh, was 152,000. Um, 111,000 came from a decrease in debt service because we completed uh, the remaining debt that we had and that was defeased in uh, fiscal year 20. And then we had a 41,000 decrease uh, in our transfer to medical fund because again, uh, we put that um, we we put that into each one of the uh, funds, and so that transfer is no longer necessary. Next slide, please. So um, we always like to show what our uh, results are. We put pulled the uh, Texas Municipal League survey of uh, water costs for residential uh, customers based on a five thousand gallon usage. And compared that, uh, they compared that uh, or did that group of um, population uh, of cities between 30 and 50,000. And so you can see on uh, this chart that uh, Duncanville ranks 14th uh, from the highest, going from highest to lowest. So we rank 14 uh, out of 23 cities, um, which is in a good, good position. Next slide, please. So again, we want to do the same thing on our wastewater cost or our sewer cost. And so same grouping of cities. Uh, we ranked much closer to the top on our sewer cost. Um, but I do want to note that uh, even though we ranked third on that list, that uh, we do utilize winter averaging. And uh, it's impossible to tell uh, from uh, all these uh, cities that responded here whether they use winter averaging or not. Uh, but uh, that does help save citizens uh, quite a bit of money. In, in other words, uh, the, the, the winter averaging uh, that we do takes uh, your winter months water usage and that's averaged out and that's what you pay your sewer is based on that usage. A lot of cities actually charge you each month, whatever water you, you use, they actually charge you a corresponding sewer charge. And so we don't do that. And there are other cities that, that do winter averaging. Quite a few cities actually do, do winter averaging. But there's just no way to know and to really understand uh, how we compare on this chart. Next slide, please. So getting into the solid waste fund, we anticipate uh, that we're gonna end the year with about uh, 35 days of fund balance for FY21. And that's with uh, a fund balance of $426,000. Next slide, please. So some of the uh, things that are uh, increasing, decreasing, uh, the revenue total was increased by 328,000. And um, that's 318,000 that's due to the full year of garbage rate increases that were enacted uh, at the beginning of January 2020. Uh, and then a 10,000 uh, in franchise receipt increase uh, from um, the garbage collector. 
And then expenditures overall increase of about 318,000. We're expecting a $389,000 increase in our garbage contract services because um, uh, we anticipate a 3% increase from them. And then a 50,000 decrease in our transfer to CIP for alley repairs. And then a 6,600 net decrease in supplies, equipment, and maintenance that we cut. And then an $8,400 decrease. Uh, again, same thing as the others. It was a transfer to the medical fund in the previous year and it's, that's no longer needed. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation uh, for uh, the public hearing for the budget and I'll turn it back over to the mayor to conduct the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Summerlin. Uh, for information council, what we will do is uh, go to the public hearing and when the public hearing concludes, uh, then any questions from council can be uh, directed to Mr. Sumlin. So uh, before we get into that, I would like to ask the city secretary, uh, do we have any individuals who are registered to speak during the public hearing? No, sir, we do not. And I do not see anybody's hands raised. So we're good. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna wait just a few seconds to, to make sure if there's any citizens, uh, you know, they're maybe pushing buttons or moving their mouse to, to get to that raised hand portion. I'm just gonna wait just, you know, 10 or 15 seconds just to make sure. Okay, we do have two now. Okay. All right, so, um, Tracy, can you please start with the first one, which would be Dave Galbraith, and then go down to Mr. John Gorion? Okay, just a minute, because hey, I, okay. I just a moment, just a moment. Um, I need to uh, I need to formally open the public hearing and, and make a couple statements. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're going to open the public hearing. The timestamp on that is eight thirty six. And uh, for those wishing to, to speak, uh, in, in accordance with our rules of procedure, uh, we are going to permit 10 minutes in total for those who wish to speak uh, in, in have any comments in favor, and 10 minutes in total for any individuals who uh, wish to speak in opposition to what has been presented. Uh, so the city secretary will be timing that. So regardless of how many people have raised their hands to speak, I will say it once again, it's 10 minutes in total uh, in favor and 10 minutes in total for any, any dissension or, or, op or opposing comments. Uh, so the, the first one, uh, I will open it up uh, for those individuals who wish to speak, I have comments in favor of the budget that has been offered. Uh, please let city secretary know that you wish to speak in favor. I have positive comments. Um, I'm not sure how I can get that. Um, I guess when they first go to speak, if they say in favor or opposed, I can keep track of the time that way. That's acceptable. We'll do it that way. So the first uh, person that you have is who? Dave Galbraith. Okay, Mr. Galbraith, if you please uh, state your name for the record and your address. Thank you. I'm looking for a video here. How, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. You won't have you won't have video, Mr. Galbraith. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. I'm Dave Galbraith, 203 Brookwood Drive, Duncanville. Um, Mayor Gordon and Duncanville City Council. It's uh, great to see that the council has received a promising redevelopment proposal for the old Toyota property on I-20 at Cockrell Hill. It is my hope that the council and WB service company can reach a win-win agreement that will satisfy their needs for a national headquarters and training center and for Duncanville to begin a mixed use development with perhaps an upscale restaurant, entertainment, and perhaps some shopping amenities. This redevelopment can be accomplished to accompany to complement the city's 2017 comprehensive plan, Destination Duncanville. I believe careful planning and negotiating can achieve a genuine win-win development. 
The city's business retention program has for years helped numerous businesses redevelop or establish complete new campuses. A national headquarters would be a great addition to the I-20 corridor and a sparkling new two or three story building on the frontage road would be a landmark destination. A few of the benefits to Duncanville of the B&W redevelopment would be significant hotel and motel rooms, restaurant customers, transportation expenses and other expenses. I see a short-term redevelopment strategy and a long-term redevelopment strategy for the Toyota property. Short-term, it is time for Duncanville to realize some real cost benefit and community development for the Toyota property. I believe this can be achieved short-term via the WMB service company proposal. Long-term, if the WMB proposal is rejected, Virtually no revenue will be generated for the city while several years of further conceptualizing land use studies and sustainable revenue producing, community serving and attractive developments can be created. I strongly urge the city council to review the latest revised WNB company proposal to see if a win-win agreement can be reached with them for short-term benefit to buyer and seller. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galbraith. Uh, while those comments don't specifically address our budget, I guess they could be obliquely associated with the progress of our city. Uh, is there anyone else uh, wishing to speak? Uh, we will take that as part of the uh, in favor of, uh, in terms of how we're categorizing comments uh, in the public hearing. Do we have anybody else? Um, city Secretary. Um well, Mr. John Goyon, did, okay, there he goes his hand. Yes, we have one more. Tracy, can you please turn on his microphone? One second, Mayor. Uh, are you there? Am I here? Yes. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, I may be out of order here because uh, I also am not commenting on the budget. I thought this was the open forum. Uh, I would like to speak this evening concerning the agenda items 5D and E. If I should do that at a later time, please let me know. Uh, yes, that would be an appropriate time uh, to do that, Mr. Guyon. So I'll wait till a, uh, another time. Will you finish the budget at this time? Any other individual city secretary? No, sir, that's everybody. Okay, seeing no other uh, individuals, uh, I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So, Mayor, I'd like a second. I'm sorry, who, who made the motion to approve? Uh, Cooks. Okay, Mr. Cooks uh, uh, made Mac the motion to close the public hearing and Mr. McMurnett seconded. Uh, a roll call vote by city secretary to close the public hearing, please. Council member Vera Cruz, four or against? Four. Pro Tem Macbernet, four or against? <coughs> four. Council member Anderson, four or against? Four. Council member Cooks, four or against? Four. Council member Jamison, four or against? Four. At large, Council Member Harvey, four are against. Four. Mayor Gordon, four are against. Four. Uh, thank you. The motion to close the public hearing is approved. Uh, we're closing the public hearing at 843. I'll now, uh, if there are any questions or, or comments uh, from city council to Mr. Summerlin. Mr. Summerlin, I've... No, Mr. Cooks. Okay. 
Okay. Mr. Sumlin, again, I know we talked about this in the briefing, but just since we are open record, would you share again about the two added uh, positions that I discussed a little bit more on uh, of adding that to our budget and how we could how we could uh, address that going forward for uh, budget year coming up in the middle of the year? Yeah, it, um, at mid-year for FY21, we can reevaluate where we're at. Um, we, we know at the moment that uh, the last couple of months have trended a little bit higher in our health tax receipts than what we had budgeted for. And so uh, it's, it's unknown at this point in time what the future months will hold in terms of the pandemic effect on our sales tax. And so we'll be in a much uh, stronger position in uh, six months into the new budget to uh, know how we're performing with that sales tax. And it'd be my recommendation that we reevaluate uh, adding positions uh, in the police department after we see how our revenues are performing. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, uh, making those comments. I know that that's important to our citizens and whether we are at a certain number or not, uh, citizens are always asking how we're looking in our police department and how we say staff. So that's important to the citizens. So it means it's important to me as well to make sure our police funding and, and positions are available for future as well. So thank you very much for uh, uh, answering those questions. Yeah, Mr. Summerlin, I had a question on slide um, 26 talking about our utility fund the reserve balance down to 37 days versus the desired goal of 60. <clears throat> Coming from, from my background in terms of the accounting process, uh, when, a, when a goal is set for some type of reserve balance it kind of makes it a uh, an accrued liability and my question would be if we were to undergo or be scrutinized by an external audit firm for looking at this reserve and being at 37 days versus what's preferred to be at a 60 with this bogey of 23 days uh, as, as I'm, I'm calling it, as, as, as I said, an accrued liability is probably not the right semantical term in the accounting parlance for, for municipalities. But with this difference of, of 23 days and the dollar amount that's involved in that, cause an external auditing firm to, to make that a material finding in an audit? It would not be a material finding. They would, however, question uh, uh, what, wh how we treated that. And we would, uh, our response would be that we've not treated it from, it's, it's not a legally encumbered amount. And so therefore there's not an accounting consequence. It's strictly a budgetary consequence that we have made a, uh, we, we, have, we have just simply made a footnote that we're trying to reserve uh, a part of our fund balance for a project. It, there's no legal encumbrance and there's no um, uh, nothing that would cause us to have to reclassify that fund balance as reserved from an accounting standpoint. Okay, so from a budgetary standpoint, that goal uh, does not have the effect of, of a, uh, an accrued liability under GAAP, is what you're saying. That, so that that's not, correct. It wouldn't have a material finding from an external audit firm. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, any other inputs from any council members? All right, uh, seeing none, thank you very much. So we'll be moving on uh, to item number uh, 5B. Uh, this is consider appointments to various boards and commissions, including Audit Committee, Board of Adjustment, City Planning and Zoning Commission, Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation Board, the Duncanville Neighborhood Vitality Commission, Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board, the Library Advisory Board, Multicultural Social Engagement Partnership, Park and Recreation Advisory Board, the Sign Control Board, the Tax Increment Financing Reinvestment Zone Number One, and the Tri-Cities Animal Control Board. Uh, for information for council, uh, looking and understanding how this is gonna proceed, 
uh, there, I'm going to first read the names uh, that we as a council have inserted into the appointment list for city for boards and commissions. And based on my reading of those names, I will entertain a motion to approve. Now, once we do that, if there are any additional names that any of council members wish to uh, discuss, uh, we will then have motions after that. I hope you understand that. So at this time, I will read the list of board and council appointments uh, that we have previously uh, nominated in session. City Planning and Zoning Commission, appointment for two-year terms, Jana McBroom, Greg Zoka, Betty Colbreth, and Eric Pena. For the Zoning Board of Adjustment, appointment for two-year terms, Carolyn Thompson, Charles Smith, Bobby Lydia, alternate number one, Yolanda Columbus, and we have a vacancy for alternate number two, which will be advertised. Park and Recreation Advisory Board, appointment for two-year terms, Alexander McLaughlin, Mary Beth Farrell, and Constance Willis. Appointment for a one-year term, Jeremy Kuntz. For the Library Advisory Board, appointment for two-year terms, Cindy Clinton, Susan Butch, Jan Knoll, Barbara Boddy, Shannon Gable. For the Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board, appointment for two-year terms, Sylvia Wilson-Clark, Barbara McComb, Alice Arnold, Yerahi Lopez, Demetra Miller, and appointment for one-year term, Jose Perales. For Sign Control Board, appointment for two-year terms, Patricia Fields, Leslie Blue, I'm sorry, Bruce, and we have a vacancy for one person on the Sign Control, which will be advertised. For the Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation Board, appointment for two-year terms, Derwin Broughton, Kenneth Govan, Tammy Abney, and Steve Dial. For the Tax Increment Financing Zone, appointment for two-year terms, Alex Wheeler, Lawrence Golden, Ishaika Gibson, for the Duncanville Neighborhood Vitality Commission, appointment for two-year terms, Brenda O'Brien, Tonya Savage, Tim Perry, and vacancy for a one-year term. For the Multicultural Social Engagement Partnership, appointment for two-year terms, Dr. Laverne Hollifield, Ann Perry, Annette Manofi, Menofi, and Lolita Moore. Lastly, for the Regional Animal Shelter Board, appointment for two-year term, Ed Priest. Chair will entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve, Mayor. Mr. Mack, second. second. Motion to approve, and Mr. Vera Cruz has seconded. We'll take a roll call vote, please, City Secretary. Um, Council Member Vera Cruz, for or against? For. Mayor Pro Tem Mac Burnett, for or against? For. Council Member Anderson, for or against? For. Council Member Cooks, for or against? For. Council Member Jamison, for or against? For. At large, Council Member Harvey, for or against? For. Mayor Gordon, for or against? For. Thank you very much for that unanimous decision on that motion. Okay, uh, Chair will entertain a motion for any additional names. Any additional names to be uh, nominated? Mr. Mac Burnett, I see your hand. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, I would like to nominate Robin Felder for the one-year term for the, the Neighborhood Vitality Committee. 
Is there a second to that? Second. Uh, that was Mr. Harvey, if I saw that right. Is that correct? You are correct. Okay. Um, we have a motion to add Robin Felder for the one-year term to the Duncanville Neighborhood Vitality Commission. Um, any discussion on that? Okay, uh, roll call vote, city secretary. Council member Vera Cruz, for or against? For. Mayor Pro Tem McBurnett, for or against? For. Council member Anderson, for or against? For. Council member Cooks, for or against? For. Council member Jamison, for or against? For. At large, council member Harvey, for or against? For. Mayor Gordon, for or against? Four. Thank you. That motion is approved. And that concludes item 5B of our agenda on boards and commissions. Moving on to item 5C. Consider a resolution repealing the Duncanville Urban Land Bank Authority and pro program resolution number 2015-012017 and amending the Neighborhood Vitality Commission resolution number 2017-052. Our presenting this item is Ms. Jessica James, Director of Economic Development, Ms. James. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the background and the actions for a council to consider this evening to uh, take the actions that you had directed us to. Uh, during the city council's briefing on August 4th, the city council did direct staff to bring back an agenda item to disestablish the urban land bank since it hadn't been active since its creation. In order to disestablish a land bank, the following actions are required. Uh, First would be to repeal resolution number 2015-012017, which actually created the Duncanville Urban Land Bank Authority and Program. The second item for council to consider would be to amend the Neighborhood Vitality Commission resolution number 2017-052, which removes the mention of the land bank under the commission's responsibilities. Right now it does list uh, the commission as the board members for the urban land bank. So both items, if this is the desire of council, both items would need to take place. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mayor? Mayor, I'd like, do you hear me? You're muted. I'm sorry, yes, I'm talking, nobody's here. Yes, Ms. Jamison. Um, I would like to uh, make a motion to uh, repeal the, the resolution for the Duncanville Urban Land Bank Authority and Program Resolution number 2015-01-2017 and amend the Neighborhood Vitality Commission resolution number 2017-052. We have a motion to approve item 5C. Is there a second? I'll second it, Mayor. Um, um, Mayor Pro Tem Mac Burnett has seconded. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, uh, City Secretary, roll call vote, please. Sorry. Council Member Bear Cruz, for or against? For. Mayor Pro Tem Mac Burnett, for or against? For. Council Member Anderson, for or against? For. Council Member Cooks, for or against? For. Council Member Jamison, for or against? For. At large, Council Member Harvey, for or against? For. Mayor Gordon, for or against? For. Thank you. Uh, item 5C is approved. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, uh, this is uh, Attorney Hager. Uh, since we had someone speak uh, during the budget um, public hearing and we have another speaker, it would be appropriate for you to, with the council's consent, to go ahead and reopen the citizens' comments 
to receive the comments uh, from, I guess, Mr. Galbraith, and, and then uh, the comments from the other speaker who has not spoken yet with regard to their uh, subject. Question, Mr. Hager. We heard Mr. Galbraith in its in his entirety. I understand could it be just acceptable to hear Mr. Guyon? Yes, it would. Uh, but I want those comments to be uh, referred back to the citizens comment portion of the meeting. So that would require you to reopen the citizens comment portion of the meeting uh, for those comments, since we have no other agenda item that would uh, address citizens comments. Okay, so I need to reopen the citizen comment portion of the agenda. Uh, this is item three on our agenda. Uh, we are reopening the citizens input. And uh, in, with, with that, I have read into the record all of that information that is contained on the agenda. And that our city attorney's recommendation and advice, uh, any comments uh, that Mr. Galbraith made will be associated with item 3A. Uh, D, item 5D, and we will open the, uh, the floor to Mr. Guyon, who wishes to uh, speak uh, on item 5D. Mr. Guyon, would you please state your name and address, and you have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we have you. Uh, and I, I apologize. I registered to speak, and apparently something, I got my email back that confirmed my registration, but the login didn't work, so I'm not sure what happened. It was my first time to attempt to register for the Zoom meeting. My name is John Guyon, G-U-Y-L-N. I reside at 302 Willowbrook Drive, Duncanville, Texas. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I appear before you this evening to share concerns surrounding the agenda items 5D and E, the demolition contract proposal with Midwest Wrecking Company of Texas for the property at 730 East I-20. I do not speak to the merits of the demolition company's ability to perform under the submitted contract. Rather, I speak to the wisdom of the dem demolition itself as the best use of the for property by the city of Duncanville. In brief, the property has been a non-performing asset of the citizens of Duncanville for approximately nine years. The first six years of those, it was owned by the school district. The city purchased the property from DISD owner about 2018. As a non-performing asset, the land has contributed no tax revenue for the city since acquisition. Upon completion of the demolition project proposed, the property will become an empty green space with the intent to sell for future development. During this time of marketing, the property will remain a non-performing asset to the citizens of Duncanville. It is my understanding that during the period of time that the city has owned the property, nearly two years, that w &B Service Company, currently located at 1200 North Main, has submitted multiple purpose purchase proposals for the property. Each purchase proposal has been declined. It is further my understanding that this con company continues in its desire to purchase the property and therefore the sale of the property to this entity is still a viable option. As we continue to seek ways to accomplish the city's goal of increasing our sustainable commercial footprint and therefore taxable resources, I ask the council to take into consideration your fiduciary responsibility for the best use of city assets. The entity WB Service Company is an existing commercial business within the city of Duncanville, expressing their desire to expand their footprint within our city limits. WB is not an upstart company, but rather a company that was founded in 1952 and maintains operation sites in four states. That's two minutes. Thank you. In conclusion, I'm not here to advocate for the sale of the property. I simply ask the decision to approve or decline the proposal for demolition be discussed under agenda item five. D and E include the knowledge of what is best used of taxpayer dollars. Remember, sunk cost fallacy that describes our tendency to throw good money after bad just because you already spent money on something. Mr. Guyon, I, I need Thank to, you very much. I, I, I need to bring your, your speech to a halt in excess of two minutes for you to continue. I would have to, to put it to a vote of the entire council to allow you to continue. I, I'm finished, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Guyon. All right, so city council members, um, any member may choose to change the order of what we put on the agenda, and I am taking the opportunity to, to do so. Um, item 
5D and 5E are associated with our information to, uh, and discussion in executive session. As a result of executive session, there is no action to be taken as a result of executive session. As a result of no action to be taken in executive session, which affects item 5D and 5E, in that particular respect, then 5D and 5E do not need to be discussed and may be dispensed with as a result of the council taking no action as a result of executive session. And I wanna make sure uh, by our city attorney that what I have stated and the process we are taking is correct. Yes, Mayor, at this point, uh, since there is no action coming out of executive session, you can proceed with uh, to entertain any motions on 5D or E. Okay, uh, is there any motion uh, to approve item 5D? Seeing no motion to approve 5D, 5D is dispensed with. Is there any motion to approve item 5E? Seeing no motion to approve item 5E, item 5E is dispensed with as well. And we have taken care of item 5F. There is no action to be taken on item 5F. Wherefore, we will proceed with item five, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, item six, staff and board reports. And we have been provided this information previously. Are there any questions from any of our city council members for the reports for the monthly finance report? as of July 31st, 2020. Seeing no questions or inputs, are there any questions to um, the Public Works Department quarterly report? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, that brings our city council meeting for the 1st of September, 2020 to a close. And the timestamp on our adjournment is 9.06. Thank you very much and good evening.